Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkaj. Deep cracks in a long-running partnership are starting to emerge in the South Caucasus. Armenia recently refused to host drills by the CSTO, a security organization of former Soviet states. Instead, it invited the U.S. military to hold joint exercises on its soil. The move angered Moscow, which summoned Armenia's ambassador to denounce the drills and other rhetoric it labeled anti-Russian. Earlier this month, Armenia's prime minister said it was a strategic mistake to depend solely on Russia for its security needs. The 10-day military exercise dubbed Eagle Partner was held outside the capital, Yerevan. It follows mounting tensions in Karabakh, a region Armenia and Azerbaijan went to war over back in 2020. Armenia recently accused Russia, which has peacekeepers in the region, to enforce a ceasefire of not helping protect Armenian soldiers. A series of deadly border clashes have broken out this year, fueling a military buildup from both Baku and Yerevan. And to discuss the U.S.-Armenia military drills and current situation in the South Caucasus, joining me now from Washington, D.C., is Eugene Chausowski. He is a senior director at Newslines Institute. And from Istanbul, Idil Tunjar Kalavuz. She is an associate professor at Medeniyet University. A warm welcome to you both, and thanks for joining me on Straight Talk. So, Idil, what could you tell us about this joint military exercise between Armenia and the U.S.? And what do you make of its timing? when tensions are once again simmering between Baku, Yerevan, and Moscow? Yes, the timing is uh, very uh, important. Uh, as you uh, know, uh, that uh, the uh, relations between Armenia and uh, Russia uh, was not uh, going very uh, well uh, nowadays. Uh, Pashinyan, uh, Prime Minister of Armenia, uh, recently stated that it was uh, a strategic uh, mistake to depend on uh, Russia uh, for the uh, defense of uh, Armenia. They gave the signal, uh, perhaps, that this is going to uh, change. And uh, the timing of this military uh, exercises uh, with the United States now, although there are very uh, few uh, military uh, personnel uh, is going to uh, be involved in this military uh, drill. It's symbolic, sim uh, symbolically uh, important uh, that I think uh, Armenia is giving a signal to uh, Russia that uh, they uh, can uh, turn to the uh, West uh, mm -hmm. in uh, their uh, alliances uh, policies because recently uh, they were not uh, very uh, happy with the Russian uh, policies uh, in the uh, region. They think uh, that uh, Armenia is not uh, very uh, well supported by yes. uh, Russia. So, uh, Eugene, what do you think? Is this a concrete sign that Yerevan is explicitly moving away from Russia? And could Armenia easily decouple uh, from Russia since its security architecture is greatly linked to it? Yes, I mean, I do think that it's a sign, certainly, of Armenia's frustration with Russia, not only hosting um, these uh, drills with, with the U.S., but also canceling um, the CSTO drills that it was uh, initially planned to host uh, with Russia, along with the other CSTO members. Now, whether it's a sign of a more strategic shift away from Russia, I, I'm a little bit more skeptical of that, given just the, the sheer... Uh, security, economic, uh, and, and diplomatic uh, linkages uh, between Armenia and Russia. Certainly, Armenia under Pashinyan has uh, opened up um, somewhat to the West. We've seen, obviously, the EU and U.S. involved in negotiations over the Karabakh issue. But uh, strategically speaking, it's going to be very difficult for Armenia uh, to replace Russia as a strategic ally. There's, you know, troops hosted in, Russian troops hosted in Armenia, now you have yes. Russian troops yes. um, in Nagorno-Karabakh as well. So that's going to be a much more difficult uh, stance to shift for Pashinyan. So I did, why do you think Armenia has refused to host uh, drills or join the drills by the CSTO? Uh, what was the reason behind it? So it was, again, a uh, frustration uh, of uh, Armenia uh, against Russian uh, policies. I guess it was another uh, signal... Uh, at the beginning of the year, they also uh, stated that they are not going to uh, involve uh, in the military drills of uh, CSTO anymore, or they're not going to host uh, CSTO military exercises in their uh, territory. 
Uh, so it was uh, at the beginning an early uh, sign uh, that uh, they might uh, be uh, sending a signal again to uh, Russia uh, that not with uh, CSDO but maybe with the United States and with uh, NATO uh, they can again uh, turn into uh, their uh, support. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Eugene, meanwhile, Armenian Prime Minister uh, Pashinyan has announced his intention to uh, fully ratify the Rome Statue of the ICC in Parliament. What do you make of this move? Because he says this ratification has nothing to do uh, with uh, Russia-Armenia relations, but rather it is necessary to be able to hold um, Azerbaijan accountable for its aggressions against Armenia. Is this really the case? I think right now Armenia is searching for any type of leverage that it can have uh, when it comes to uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and relations with Azerbaijan. Uh, in, the, in the recent war at the end of 2020, obviously militarily Armenia suffered a significant defeat and you know, lost some of those territories surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, what we've seen transpire since then, there were actually some progress made towards uh, diplomatic towards economic uh, uh, relationships being built up between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But we've seen in recent months how that's obviously gone very much sideways, uh, you know, first with this uh, Latvian corridor mm -hmm. uh, issue, but mm -hmm. also all of the, you know, security flare-ups that we've seen. So I think Armenia, on the one hand, does feel pressure uh, to come to some sort of a, of a deal under Pashinyan. But on the other hand, there are elements that are certainly uh, there to scuttle it, not only within Armenia, but also externally as well. Russia, as a mediator, uh, has not exactly been, uh, you know, the most uh, favorable ally for, for Armenia. So it makes sense that Armenia is taking all of these moves, uh, both diplomatic and otherwise, to try to rectify the situation. So, it did, does it seem to you that Armenia has been given um, some guarantees from its uh, Western partners in return of its confrontational moves against Moscow? I mean, how do you read all of these? So, it is uh, very hard to uh, know uh, if there were some uh, guarantees uh, given uh, by the United uh, States uh, to uh, Armenia. So, we uh, cannot uh, know. Uh, giving the uh, information uh, we uh, have. Uh, we don't know uh, this, but um, I am uh, thinking that uh, it was uh, always in the history of this conflict, it was uh, like this. When there was a, uh, a problem uh, with uh, Russia with uh, during the uh, negotiations, so the Armenia was turning into a West and Western powers, United States and European powers, when there was a problem with it, they were uh, turning into uh, Russia uh, in order to uh, find some international uh, help. But this process did not bring any uh, solution of the uh, problem. So more mm -hmm. internationalization, I guess, uh, is not going to be uh, um, sol uh, solving the problem, the conflict uh, in the uh, region and the problems of uh, Armenia. Uh, I think perhaps uh, more regionalization of the uh, conflict, working with uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkey, with other uh, countries uh, in the uh, region, it can be a better uh, solution of this uh, conflict. Yeah, so uh, Eugene, could the reopening of the Lachin Corridor add momentum to the efforts of normalization between uh, Baku and Yerevan? And, Yerevan? and what kind of a role do you think did Russia play in here? Right. So I think the, the Latvian corridor right now is really the key to all of this, you know, going back several months with, with that uh, route being closed. Now, from Azerbaijan's perspective, what they're trying to do is essentially, and what they've been trying to do since the end of the war back in uh, the end of 2020, is open uh, linkages uh, between the two countries. Uh, so not only the, the Latvian corridor, but also uh, the Zangazur corridor, because Azerbaijan wants access to its uh, exclave in um, in Nakhchivan. Uh, and now Agdam is also an, another route that they've been looking at. So essentially, they're trying to get leverage, you know, by, by squeezing essentially the Latvian quarter to try to open up those linkages, which have been the topic of discussion and of the basically diplomatic agreement all along. Now, part of that now is using some uh, security, you know, whether that's military or this uh, sort of gray zone uh, elements of pressure in order to do that. And this is how we find ourselves in this current situation. 
So meanwhile, the tensions have also risen between Russia and Azerbaijan over Baku's statement on uh, regional elections held over the weekend in the areas of Ukraine uh, claimed by uh, Russia. So is Russia losing its influence on Azerbaijan as well? Um, yeah, uh, th th there were that kind of uh, movements and uh, statements, but uh, I don't think that the relations are going to be uh, deteriorated. Uh, so the relations uh, of uh, Azerbaijan is uh, good uh, with Russia, with other uh, countries uh, in the region, also uh, internationally, and they have uh, close relations with uh, Russia. And um, so they have uh, good uh, relations. I don't think that uh, it is going to be uh, deteriorated. Azerbaijan is implementing a balanced uh, policy. And uh, also they have economic uh, relations, uh, connections. Uh, so I don't think that uh, this is uh, going to uh, deteriorate uh, uh, relations. So Eugene, how will all these backlashes from uh, two ex-Soviet states affect Russia's integral uh, role as a peace guarantor in the region? So I think Russia's role as a peace guarantor has already been somewhat compromised. Uh, obviously, Russia right now is very focused uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, that doesn't preclude Russia from being active in other areas, as we've seen. But I think that you know, to, uh, with Russia deploying uh, troops under the agreement to sort of keep the peace after the 2020 war, the fact that we were seeing, you know, not only regular ceasefire violations, but now this blockade situation and the accompanying economic fallout and the humanitarian cost, I think is a pretty clear indictment on, on Russia's role. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not exactly the case that Russia is trying necessarily to get peace for both two countries. It has its own interests into account. But because of its distractions in the war in Ukraine, because of the rise of other regional players in this uh, uh, zone, like Turkey especially, I think we're seeing the, the challenges, the increasing challenges that Russia has in keeping this region uh, stable and in favor to its own interests. So uh, we always talk about how the uh, balance of power in the South Caucasus has changed after uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, Idil. Um, how have other players capitalized on this? Uh, Eugene just mentioned Turkey's role, but which other countries come to the fore when we talk about the stability and the Caucasus? And, and what do you make of the U.S.'s and the European Union's roles in the region? Um, yeah, in the uh, region, the balance of power, as you said, uh, changed. Uh, now uh, they are uh, asymmetry of uh, power. Uh, power is the uh, in favor of uh, Azerbaijan uh, after the second uh, Karabakh uh, war. Uh, and um, so uh, Turkey uh, was uh, supportive uh, of uh, Azerbaijan always. But um, at the uh, same uh, time, uh, Turkey would like to have uh, a uh, stable peace uh, in the uh, region and a normalization of uh, relations with uh, Armenia. So the peace and stability in the region is very uh, important uh, for uh, Turkey and a permanent peace is going to be uh, very important for all the countries in the region. Uh, nobody uh, wants a, uh, another uh, war. All right, Idil and Eugene, unfortunately, will have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.